uh, good to be with you <clears throat> since I drove here from the Twin Cities. Um, the further you get away from home, the more of an expert you are. So uh, over two and a half hours on the highway, I could feel my expertise growing uh, and, uh, and, and delighted to be here. And, um, and I got here early so I could look around downtown and um, experience the, I think it's the 116 coffee shop, right? A really good latte. Uh, and then the art gallery. Um, and, um, and then Bill drove me out to the community college, which is like an art gallery. <clears throat> so, um, and then I've been aware through Bill of your uh, community conversations. Uh, and <clears throat> you may know that Bill Adams uh, uh, talks to everybody. <clears throat> and so whenever I've been on uh, uh, webinars and other sorts of things that we've been doing for our project, they all know about Fergus Falls and the community conversations in this sort of nice low-key way. So what you're doing actually, a lot of people are paying attention to across the country. So this um, is going to be a very interactive conversation. <clears throat> it's being um, videotaped so we can teach other professionals how to conduct community conversations. Um, and uh, so it could be asking, so it'll be very uh, participatory. Uh, the theme is, are we overdosing on healthcare? <clears throat> uh, and I'd like to ask a few of you if you'd be willing to say, uh, why you came out tonight to a conversation, other than the free food. Um, why, you, why you came, oh, somebody said, oh, you didn't see it back there. Okay, no, there's food back there. Uh, I was wondering, in fact, why you, how you could get away with meeting over the dinner hour, and then when I walked in, I, I understood. So uh, if a few of you would be willing to just say, just introduce yourself and say why you chose to come out to a, a community conversation on the topic of whether we are overdosing. On healthcare. So, would somebody be willing to? Good evening. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Bill, for coming. And, yeah. and uh, Joe, was it Joe today? Bill and Bill. Bill and Bill. Bill and Bill. Yeah, Bill and Bill. Um, I work in long-term healthcare for a few decades, and uh, one one thing I've noticed in my work is that we are spending a lot of money and making investment in finding out information that we don't use. And I've heard doctors tell me that, I've heard medical directors of our care centers tell me that. And one of the reasons they're doing that is because of the legal consequences of not finding out enough information about the patient and the fear of litigation. Okay. So I'm very concerned about that for America. I'm so I'm, so you're, getting, you're, you're ahead in the agenda. Okay. So just briefly, why you came here tonight? I'm, I'm really interested in what we're doing in America and how we're beginning to engage Americans in how we take care of health care right. in this country. Thank you. Great. So that was the good role model for the crisp response to the question. Thank you. So um, who else would just like to say why you, why you came out? Who would like to go? Yes. Uh, I'm Larry Schultz, the CEO of Lake Region Healthcare, here not only because we're helping sponsor the event, but very interested in uh, what others have to say about helping uh, all of us accomplish a triple aim. Right. And tell them what the triple aim is. Uh, triple aim is how do we improve the health of the population, improve uh, care experience, and lower the uh, overall cost of health care. Thank you. So how about somebody who is not an uh, otherwise healthcare professional or administrator uh, say why you came here tonight? Would somebody else like to say why they came? Okay. Uh, good evening. Pete Wasberg with Ottertail Power Company. I head up human resources and safety and uh, certainly one of the nice benefits that we provide to our employees and we want to continue that for a long time to come is healthcare and of course the costs have been escalating at a pace that's uh, hard to stomach both uh, for our employees and for our company. So we're trying to learn more about how our employees can be better consumers and how we can be a better consumer as a company. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anybody else like to, to say why they came? Yes. I'm on the other end of the spectrum. I'm Dr. Vessel. I'm a cancer doctor. I probably overutilize more things than you can shake a stick at over the years. <laughs> And part of it is legal, as you mentioned in the past, but I think I came tonight, so I'd like to hear what the community is thinking about and get us on the right track. Great, thank you. Okay, 
Uh, so Bill Adams, if you pick them up again, because we're going to do something more here. So if we have a series of handouts. Um, if, so if you could open this on your, uh, on your, your uh, table uh, to the second page. Uh, the theme here of tonight's conversation is the cultural belief that more health care is better health care. Okay, so that, that's what we're going to be addressing. But we want to start with some background information that we believe is well grounded in the research and, and what's known out there. Uh, so this, this, we're going to start with some background information and then we're going to move into a series of, of uh, conversational questions. And so this uh, handout then uh, on the second page of yours uh, is um, background information on overuse and overspending in healthcare. And, and Bill and I are going to uh, uh, share the reading of this. So I'm going to go first. Uh, first, uh, U.S. healthcare spending is out of control and becoming unsustainable. In 2013, we spent $2.9 trillion, 17% of the nation's total output, which is expected to rise to $5.2 trillion in 2023, 19% of output. Unchecked, healthcare spending will squeeze out funding for all other sectors of society. We are not getting more for all this extra spending. On many health care indicators, such as life expectancy and infant mortality, we fall behind other developed nations that spend far less per capita. Overuse in health care is a big contributing contributor to overspending. We get too many unnecessary tests, medications, and procedures. The Institute of Medicine estimates that we spend $210 billion per year in unnecessary services. Examples antibiotic treatment for viral illnesses, annual EKGs for people without symptoms, diagnostic imaging for low back pain in the absence of danger signs, routine prostate cancer screening, and futile technological care for people who are dying. Unnecessary medical services also cause harm. Harms to patients include medication side effects, complications from unwarranted procedures, false positive tests that lead to more tests and procedures, and suffering from invasive procedures at the end of life. The economic sources of overuse in healthcare are well documented. They include greater profits for expensive technologies and medications, a payment system of incentives for, for providers to do more, and a widespread lack of understanding of what services cost in everyday practice. Cultural sources of overuse are largely unaddressed. There is a widely shared cultural idea that more health care is better health care. So that's, a, that's an informational background for the conversation that we want to have here. So leave that on, Bill. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Didn't he read well? All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, that's an informational background for the focus we're going to have here on something that we can all do something about, and that is our own beliefs that more health care is better health care. And that's pretty widely documented that Americans tend to assume if it's newer, it's more expensive, um, if the doctor acts, if the doctor gives me a prescription, it's better than not getting a prescription, even if, in the case of viral illnesses, an antibiotic doesn't actually help. Um, so, so what we really want to focus on is the cultural idea that more is better because the, what we believe in this group, the little group called Baby Boomers for Balanced Healthcare, is if we don't address the cultural assumption, then other forms of healthcare change and reform are not going to work. They're going to they're going to backfire unless we all change at the same time. So, so we're going to have our first uh, our first conversational question. And that is, so now you go to the second, hand, second handout, so page three, which is handout number two. Now these are the discussion questions for the evening. So the, the first then, the cultural sources of the more is better idea. So here's the question. Assuming you agree that medical overuse is a problem and that, more, that the more is better cultural belief is a contributor, what do you think are the sources of this belief? Why do so many of us assume that we're getting better care when it's newer, more expensive, and involves more things being done to us? So I'm going to read that one more time. And then the 
the, the procedure is going to be this. It's going to give us all a moment of individual reflection, so a moment of silent reflection on that question. And then I'm going to ask you to pair up with somebody at your table to talk about that for a few minutes, and then we'll, we'll pull things out of the group. So you're going to go into a moment of reflection on this question. Assuming you agree that medical use is a problem, and that the more is better cultural belief is a contributor, what do you think are the sources of this belief? Why do so many of us assume that we're getting better care when it's newer, more expensive, and involves more things being done to us? So let's have a moment uh, of silent reflection for you to think about your response to that. Uh, write down a note or two if you like. At the end of that minute, I'm going to ask you to pair up. Moment of reflection. Okay, so when I say go, I'd like you to find somebody you didn't come with tonight. <clears throat> there are a lot of people you did not come with. Okay, um, and so don't don't do it yet. So I want you to pair up. Uh, you don't leave some poor third person alone, however. Uh, so you could have three, but if you're table four, please don't do four because you only have three minutes for this. Okay, and you won't get everybody in. So pair up or a third, if possible, if necessary. Go. <clears throat> Okay, if you could wrap up. Ding, 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 ding. ding. If you like me, I want to get in my last great point before the end. Uh, so uh, now we'd just like, like to invite some folks to share uh, something that, uh, that you came up with as uh, one of the sources of the cultural idea that more is better or something that particularly struck you at your table that you uh, would like to share. Uh, so who would like to, what table would like to go first? I see you pointing at somebody there. Yeah, you can also volunteer somebody else. Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> our first one, we've got a list here, but our first one was drug marketing and advertising. Okay. How it's in our face constantly. Yeah, yeah. Didn't used to be when some of us grew up, there weren't those. Uh, I can remember the first one, the, the purple pill, right? And there was a woman dancing. You know, I knew what the purple pill was, uh, but I sure wanted to find out because she was so happy. Uh, and it was Prilosec, one of the uh, you know the new medications for uh, for uh, reflux and other sorts of things. They didn't even say what it was, but I sure wanted it. Okay. Uh, and it was new and very expensive. Uh, some of the older ones were off the market, you know, all all, all, all patent, and uh, so that that sure one. So. Uh, so you, you have one over here? One of our group mentioned that there's an expectation that we owe it to ourselves to do the best we can mm -hmm. and get the latest and greatest because it's out there. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, he's asking you to elaborate on that, yes. Well, um, one of the other things um, that we mentioned too is greed because we haven't used everything that we paid for in our health insurance, and so we got to take care of it. <laughs> okay. So, so two there. One is the, the the latest and greatest, and it's sort of in our culture in some ways, right? It's sort of, you know, I'm I'm uh, I drove here in my new my new Prius, you know, and uh, so it, I, it shows me I get better gas mileage, you know. And every every time you put your foot on the gas pedal, it shows you what your gas mileage is. So, it's a boomer mentality. And it's a boomer. It's a boomer. Yeah, yeah. We passed it on to our children. Uh, and then the other one's interesting. It's sort of, uh, it's sort of like uh, people uh, if, if they if they have sick time coming to them, right? If I have six six days a year and I haven't used them, well, darn it, you know, I use them. Yeah. So there's a way in which, particularly for those of us who are fortunate enough to have pretty good insurance, right? It's a, it's a tempting to uh, to overuse and to expect. Okay, uh, other ideas of why why we have this cultural belief. Okay. Could you uh, hand it back to Mr. Sure. Along with the insurance uh, question, or 
comment. I think for our, for our people I know that once they've met their deductibles, they paid so much for insurance that they're going to pile on, and they're going to do all these other things. And they're if they didn't meet their deductible, they're going to buy one EpiPen. But if they met their deductible, they're going to take the maximum six. And I think that that's uh, one of the areas. Often without realizing that we could be actually hurting ourselves in the process, right? Not not just uh, spending too much money, but but actually doing some harm to ourselves. So how about how about some other folks? Anything interesting come up at this table here? Oh, we yeah, have so it doesn't have to be that interesting. But just, <laughs> you talk for a while, yeah. right? Okay. Yes. Anybody watch 60 Minutes about? The brain tumor that was cured, cured with a polio virus. Yeah. I'm not even practicing anymore, and I got a call from a patient's family, and they want it, and they want to go where they can get it. So I think that the press sometimes is driving a lot of this stuff, particularly on new discoveries. They used to attend our meetings, and anything that looked new, everybody should have it. Yeah, I saw, I saw that show, and I, I uh, of course, you know, it's very exciting, and yeah. I felt badly for people who think, you know, and sometimes I've seen things on the the news that some some rats were cured, yeah. <laughs> you know, it hadn't even gone to humans. Um, so this this really uh, feeds it for people who are who are suffering. You see a lot of Alzheimer's cures, right, on, that are on the paper now. And so it feeds this idea that this new thing, which is often quite expensive and sometimes quite harmful, mm -hmm. right, because it hasn't really the safety has a, a lot of times it's been wrong. Okay, uh, what else? Is there important ideas that are coming up? Yeah. Um, we were looking at that individuals come in and they're looking for answers mm -hmm. and they're quite emotional and so sometimes it's the only thing offered or they keep getting offered those things because um, this test came out that that's negative and so they, they keep wanting an answer yeah. um, and yeah. sometimes that's... Yeah, so this, I, this idea, and I, I, I'm not a physician but I consult a lot with physicians and, and sometimes there aren't answers, right? Uh, and sometimes you just don't know. Uh, and uh, but if, but we if we live in a culture where we think that medicine ought to be an exact science, and people ought to know, then then we push for more tests and and uh, and physicians want to want to collaborate, want to you know want to do good, uh, and then what we've been learning, of course, is that some of those tests then show things that are not necessarily harmful, right? Um, um, but uh, you know, you do enough chest X-rays, you'll find enough funny things in people's lungs, okay? And then you start to track the funny things down, uh, and with a biopsy, and, and and sometimes it's driven not by the physician, uh, but by the patient and the family, just wanting more and more. And so this is something in us uh, that that is important to look at. Yes. <coughs> Uh, Dave Bjork, I'm an internist, internist a practicing physician, and um, a lot of times anxiety on the part of the patient will kind of fuel things, and um, kind of the fear of the unknown. Sometimes the worst known is seem to be better than the unknown, and then kind of a corollary is um, <clears throat> the idea that. A lot of physicians may feel pressured by time, and sometimes it's easier to order the test rather than taking the time to just sit down and talk about, okay, what is a viral illness, or what are the <clears throat> advantages of waiting and seeing what happens over the next two or three months as opposed to jumping in to get the next scan that results in needing an unnecessary, potentially unnecessary biopsy, etc. So yeah. it's complicated. It is complicated. So you're talking about uh, patient anxiety, which is connected with what you were all saying. Uh, and um, and we live in a culture where the terms like watchful waiting it doesn't doesn't seem to fit the culture, right? Uh, and so I want you to do something. Uh, and then if you have time limitations, because there's a waiting room full of people, and I'm anxious, well then it's easy to go that next step. Uh, and, and, uh, and so it becomes a vicious circle. So part of, part of what we're doing, and we'll talk more about this later with the Baby Boomers for Mouse Healthcare, is to try to create a, a cultural idea that when you say, maybe we should wait a little bit, that that actually may be the very best thing for me or my family member, even if it's sort of countercultural, as opposed to the idea that if you write the prescription, because maybe it's bacterial, you know, right? 
um, that somehow you're a better physician uh, for, you know, for me and my loved ones. Uh, so, and, and this is, and part of what we're saying is the change can't just be on the part of the doctors, it has to be on the part of the rest of us um, who, uh, who understand that sometimes walking, walking along with us for a while and not doing anything new and different is actually the best care. Um, uh, so something else that hasn't, what else did you talk about that hasn't come out so far? We, we had the discussion about not having the discussion about quality of life mm -hmm. versus quantity of life and looking for what is it that you're, what do you want your life to look like and then how can I make you best uh, meet those needs? Yeah, so we're, we're not, we need to talk about that as a, as a families and as communities in order to be able to talk about whether it matters. So you guys had a nice long list, did we cover everything? Yeah, go for it. The only thing that isn't really covered is that people don't actually know what the cost of health care yeah. is. A lot of times our bills come and right. and then we don't pay the bill because the health care company has decreased the cost of the yeah. bill because of agreements and um, we just don't have a clue what it really costs. Yeah, yeah. just having bought a car recently because my 20 year old car finally died. Um, if you're buying a new car you, you, actually, each of those things you have to decide on, there is, a, there is an amount of money, right? So you have to decide if you want the, you know, the fancy stuff. But with healthcare, mostly don't know. And, and, and physicians don't know either. They don't know my health plan, right? They don't know my deductible. They, they don't know, in fact, from yesterday to, to, to today, the procedure or the medication could have changed. So, so, it's, it, uh, we're, so we're making these decisions. So the more is better idea played out when there aren't any clear economic consequences, uh, doesn't lead to a lot of constructive change. Okay. So, uh, anything else that anybody talked about that you want to put in before we move on? Yeah. Well, we talked about um, we don't want to take responsibility of ourselves. We would rather have um, take a pill. <laughs> it's instant. It's, it's all you have to do is. Uh, Swallow with a little water and bend your elbow, right? Um, and so, so why do you think we we uh, don't want to? What are some examples? So fill that in a little bit more. Okay. Um, well, I'll just take my example. I had high cholesterol oh, about three years ago, mm -hmm. and the doctor said I'm going to put you on Revitor or one of those. <clears throat> I said no, I'm not going to take it. And I'm going to go home and I'm going to exercise and I'm going to change my diet. And the next time I went by, back, it was down. Didn't have to do it. Mm -hmm. And so you, but you were kind of countercultural there, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, for a lot of us, we'd rather, we'd rather have the medication, a lot of people, rather than do the hard work you did. And then providers get to assume that people can't do it either. So, um, to inform me. I know the side effects. And you know the side ah, okay. You know the side effects. You, yes, yes. Because for some of these medicines, we're, we're going to be on them for life at that point, right? Yeah. Uh, and so it's a really big, it's a really big decision. Okay. Um, well, great conversation. So now we're going to move to the next set of questions. So if you look back at what is labeled handout number two, personal stories of too much health care. So you can choose part one or part two or neither. This is, it's really up to you. Uh, but here are, the, here are the, uh, the two questions. Part one, does anyone have a story about a personal or family experience with too much health care and how it affected you or a loved one? And part two, does anyone have a story about how you resisted the pull towards overuse of health care, which you did now. Yours, yours was an example of a resistance to an invitation for something that, in your case, was not necessary, right? So, does anyone have a story about how you resisted the pull towards overuse of health care? It might be a small example or a large one, okay? So, again, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna have you think about, just personally, any personal experience, family experience, of what you consider uh, too much health care and how it affected your loved one. And then, or a story of how you, or, or it could be somebody you know, resisted the pull 
towards overuse in healthcare, small or large. So take another 60 seconds now to think about your answers to those questions. And then we'll, we'll divide up again. So 60 seconds of silence. This is the silent part. <laughs> Silent reflection, thank you. Okay, when I say go, back into your your groups of two or three. Go. You don't have I've had just my routine annual physical, yeah. my doctor has said, do you want me to do any lab work? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, do you see a reason for it? Is there anything you're suspecting? And he said, no. And I said, I don't either. I don't want any. Mm -hmm. And that was fine. Yeah. So yeah. I appreciated that discussion and being given a choice. Yeah, yeah. And why did you decide no? Because I felt fine. I didn't, mm -hmm. yeah. I didn't, I wasn't thinking I had a problem. Yeah. Really. Yeah. So, yeah, in the absence of, of symptoms, uh, some of that is over testing. And, uh, and so you have a good collaborative doctor. But, but we have some physicians here who know that if people expect that, if it's part of the annual physical, and if the doctor says, no, we're not doing it, it's a little dicier. So the fact that the physician had turned the corner on this, right, and that you were okay with it, that's the, that's the change from the patient and the cultural then you get the sort of sweet spot. Okay? If we expect the physician alone to do that, have to review the evidence without, without patients and, and family members being okay with that, then, then it's harder to get change, which is part of what we're talking about here tonight. So thank you, that, that's, that's a great one. Yes? Um, I married a man with a congenital heart defect that uh, was found when he was six. And uh, when we became pregnant in our first year, um, 
I was nervous because I said, what are the odds that our child will have a heart defect? And I had gone to a, a family practitioner to deliver our baby, and she had said it's less than 5% that heart anomalies are very, very low. In fact, probably even less than that. But anyway, no tests were done prenatally. And when our daughter was born, she looked fabulous. She was eight pounds, and um, but her ninth day of life, uh, she had been. She, we went home. Everything was normal. And um, on her ninth day of life, she turned a uh, national color and quit nursing. And I took her in, and to the clinic. And um, they said you can either take her to the hospital or we'll call an ambulance. And um, we took her to a smaller hospital in Fargo. And uh, they did not have a pediatric cardiologist. Fast forward three weeks, a whole bunch of tests. They tested her for everything under the sun. Five echocardiograms couldn't rule out that she had um, a coarctation of the aorta, which is what my husband had. And the, the long and the short of it was what would have diagnosed our daughter was blood pressure. And it blew my mind that if it had been at the right amount of time to have a blood pressure on her arm and leg simultaneous, it would have diagnosed her. And um, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars in a NICU and um, very traumatic for us. And um, unbelievable to go through that. But um, a lot of lessons. And I got to say, um, we're very blessed in Minnesota. We've got great local care, we've got amazing care at Mayo, but Mayo often restrains, and they have taught me too, um, since we have subsequently followed up with them, that less can be more, and um, I, I must say, uh, their prudence in, in judicial use of medicine, it takes discipline, patience, but um, oh my word, um, subsequently, our, our daughter ended up with some um, resulting difficulties with her heart, and she has not needed the second surgery that we were told she would need, and she's 19. But they watch, they wait, and God bless them. And how's she doing in her life? She's fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Powerful story. Blood pressure cuffs. Two, two places. And then, then a care team now that is c c cautious, wise, okay, not overdoing testing, not overdoing medicine, so thank you. Okay. Um, another story doesn't have to be as powerful. Uh, another story, yes, could you hand that, hand that back to her? Thank you. I think I'll just tell a story of a friend who recently told me that she was babysitting her grandchild and she lives in Phoenix, but was up in this area to babysit the child. The child got a fever, and somehow she called somebody at the hospital or someplace, and they said, well, just watch the temp and, and that kind of thing. And somehow, later on, the child's temp spiked higher, and she freaked out. So she called the ambulance, <laughs> you know, and so went through that whole thing, and then had and went to the ER, and then it was fine, went back home. But I think. It demonstrates another kind of level of anxiety that people react to, and I don't know. And we need to brainstorm situations yeah. to handle that. So yeah, yeah. And you know, grandma's uh, watching the child is responsible to keep that. I'm a grandfather now. You know, keep the child alive is the minimal thing. Because <laughs> if I if I fail there, I'm never babysitting again. <laughs> but um, but but ER visits anxiety driven. Some hospitalizations. Um, you know, I have a, a good friend and colleague, Mac Baird, who's the chair of the family medicine department at the University of Minnesota. And, and Mac likes to say, well, the, and this may not be true now uh, as much as in the past, but you know, go back 20 years, he, he said that probably half of hospitalizations were intended to treat anxiety in the patient, the family, and sometimes the doctor. <laughs> right? Um, and so that's really what, what you're talking about. Yeah, OK. Um, yes. Could you uh, hand that one back to her? Thank you. Well, this is a short one, but I, I just had my dental exam today, and they asked me when I wanted to have my x-rays again. Mm -hmm. 
And I said, what? And they said, well, you're old enough. Isn't that nice to hear? Yeah. And if you, and you have, you know, no dental problems, you can choose when you want your, if, if you even want to have x-rays. And I said, you mean I have a choice? Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, do you want to tell us what you chose? Um, what did I choose? I said, we'll revisit it in two, after two years. Okay. But, you know, okay. I, yeah. I don't. So that was a sign, for you, that's a good sign of the times, right? Yeah, yeah. that you, I, I can choose when I want those awful bite wings in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are actually even more problems connected with x-ray than the, than the comfort, but yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I, so, I might never have it again. So, yeah, so, so uh, what, we've, what we know more about now than we did 20, 20 50 years ago is a cumulative radiation, mm -hmm. cumulative exposure over a lifetime really creates risk for things like leukemia. And then if you have a friend, like I have a good friend who, you know, age 64, you know, acute leukemia, um, you know, he survived. But this makes me much more sensitive to those things than it used to be. Uh, in, in our Baby Boomers for Balance Healthcare group, which we'll talk about later, it's a little citizen action group, one of the, we, we, we tell some of these stories ourselves. And, and a woman in the group uh, went to her physician for uh, her cold wasn't going away, her cough, chest felt congested, so she finally went in. And she checked in at the front of the desk, and they said, first step is your x-ray, go to x-ray. And she said, what? I didn't see the doctor yet. Well, the procedure is you get the x-ray, but she refused. <laughs> she did not need one. But talk about pseudo-efficiency, yeah. that you're going to get an x-ray as if that is a harmless procedure, uh, before you even <laughs> see a physician. And so she resisted that. She resisted that. Um, so another, a, a, another story. Who else has one? Yes. True confession. <laughs> I used to get sinus infections all of the time and expected an antibiotic for that. So I went in and uh, met with a person who I didn't know, and she said, uh, you probably don't really need an antibiotic. You probably have a virus, and antibiotic's not really going to help you. Well, I knew that I needed an antibiotic, and I beat her down to the point where she finally <laughs> gave me a prescription for an antibiotic, and she was right. It didn't do a thing for me, and so I haven't gone back and demanded an antibiotic since then. So. Did you ever apologize to the court? No. no. <laughs> okay, we're going to put your little thing on YouTube. <laughs> but it's a really good example of, of, of the patient uh, expectations and our expectations. And of course, the problem we now know is that that, that antibiotic, <clears throat> let's assume it didn't hurt you, but we are developing antibiotic resistance uh, in, across the human population so that it's you know, like the herd effect with vaccines, you've heard, it, you've heard of that. <clears throat> There's also a herd effect <clears throat> with antibiotics, unnecessary antibiotics. So somebody out there dies because of an accumulation of unnecessary antibiotics that create these resistant bugs. So, so each small decision of overuse can have uh, ripples outward. Uh, any other stories that uh, anybody? Yep, you've got one. OK. It's a grandma story. A grandma story. We had a granddaughter about two years ago at a hospital down the road a little ways. And then we went to see the new baby. And she had a funny little tendency. She would stick her tongue out at you. And I said, oh, that's, that's kind of cute. It's unusual. Well, the doctor came to do rounds and said, oh my gosh, that's a sign of Down syndrome. We need to test this baby. So before they could take the child home the next day, they were required to have this blood test done. Required, because at this point, the kids are so freaked out that their child has Down syndrome. Yeah. So they drew the blood, which was an incredibly traumatic situation for these first-time parents. It didn't go well. The baby screamed. They went home traumatized. About three days later, the baby quit sticking its tongue out. And days after that, the test came back, of course, totally negative, but they still had to pay the bill. And, you know, Grandma at the time said, this child does not have Down syndrome. But because of the physician's concern and recommendation, they went ahead with that. Yeah. 
watchful waiting. Where was it? Right. If the child had Down syndrome, they were going to have it in three days. <laughs> it was going to be that three days. And it goes back to, go back to something you were saying earlier, something you were saying earlier about you know, reliability and let's catch it now. You're here now. Let's catch it now. So there's that sort of impulse. Um, so I want to tell just a, a little story of my own, uh, keeping up with some of the what's out there in the research about the prostate-specific antigen test, the PSA test, some of you may follow that. It used to be sort of uh, routinely, uh, men at a certain age would, would get it, and David started to come in and saying there's so many false positives with it. <clears throat> That's really a, it's, it's really a, something that you should talk about with your doctor. You shouldn't just routinely do it. Uh, so I got referred to a urologist for some issues, and, um, uh, uh, and he said, well, we're doing this other thing, we'll, we'll do a PSA. And I said, so I've been looking at this research, and I, I, you know, I'm not so sure about this, and I'm, I'm inclined not to. And he said, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, that, some of that research is bogus. Uh, I'll send the nurse in. And I sat there, and he waltzed out of the room. And I sat there, and I followed him out. I walked out. First time I ever walked out of the doctor's office. Uh, but he just overrode me, uh, and I was not going to, not going to put up. I'm sure the nurse came in to draw the blood. Uh, so that was my one little resistance. <laughs> okay, here it for Bill. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, but, but okay, now I'm going to tell a wimping out story. So, you know, like you told your story of wearing somebody down. It's only when I began to get into this whole area of this overuse. Um, this, was, this was not so many years ago, like three or four years ago. I uh, uh, referred to a podiatrist. I'd had ankle surgery, a couple of them, and so there was, there was still some problems. And I thought, okay, I need a podiatrist at least as somebody to follow me, because once you're done with the surgery, you're done with the surgeon. And uh, he did a nice workup and said, uh, uh, you know, I think you're just going to have to, this inflammation probably down at some point and you have to live with it. He said, I could give you a cortisone shot, but I could do that. It probably won't help. So I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> he said, it probably won't help. And it didn't. And you can get side effects. Great story, though. Yeah, it's a good story. And like, he wasn't, he, I think he wanted to do something nice. You know? Like, you go to the restaurant and I want the burger. We don't have any burgers left, but we got chicken. So I'll try the chicken. Um, and, um, and so I just thought of that recently. Why did, why did I do that? So I got the gloves on and did this shot. It was very skillfully done. And the insurance paid for it. And uh, completely unnecessary. And you I did it because you could. Yes. Because you could. Yes. Yes. Because I could. And he wanted to be nice, you know, offer me something other than uh, this will probably go away on its own and uh, come back if it doesn't. And I'm not sure what else I'll do. Because I had surgery, two surgeries on that thing. You know, it wasn't in its old shape. So that was my my story of uh, of, of, of wiping out. So. But only remember the one where I walked out. <laughs> That's the one when you think of me. I want you to think of that. I don't know why I even shared the other story. <laughs> In fact, it wasn't true. I made that up. <laughs> Just so I could balance it off. Okay. Um, so thank you for sharing those stories. So um, what, what we now want to talk about in the remaining part is what we can do. What we can do about overuse at our own level, the level of patients, the level of, and we're all patients, by the way. Some folks are physicians and nurses, but we're all patients too, right? So at the level of individuals and as a culture, what kinds of things can we do? So if you look at the next page of your handout, the Choosing Wisely is an initiative of the American Board of Internal Medicine, started a few years ago. Uh, and they now have dozens of medical specialties who have come up with their list of five or ten overused or unnecessary tests and procedures. And so it's a very impressive national movement that's occurring. Uh, and a number of the things we talked about here are on those lists. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and so it's really propelling 
at the level of physicians and providers this, this idea of, of uh, resisting overuse. But they also have come up with uh, five questions to ask your doctor before you get any test, treatment, or procedure. And uh, consumers, uh, Consumer Reports is uh, partnering with the American Board of Internal Medicine and the Choose You Wisely campaign uh, for the kind of public distribution. And so what they're working on now is the public distribution. And so these are five questions to ask your doctor before you get any test, treatment, or procedure. So the first one, do I really need <clears throat> this test or procedure? Medical tests help you and your doctor or other healthcare provider decide how to treat a problem, and medical procedures help to actually treat it. But the question is, do I really need this? Um, so did you really need the MRI if, if the surgery was going to happen? Uh, uh, in a small group, we've been doing small group conversations like this in the Twin Cities, <clears throat> and a patient uh, told this story and, and, and gave us permission to share it. What he asks a doctor who is offering him a new, proced a new uh, procedure, a medication, he asks the, his version of the question this way, are you offering me this to make me happy or because I really need it? And half of the time, the doctor withdraws the request. So my cortisone shot was a perfect example to make me happy, but it was not really needed. So do I really need it? <clears throat> what are the risks? Will there be side effects? What are the chances of getting results that aren't accurate? Could that lead to more testing or another procedure? So we're much more aware today, both in medicine and in the culture, of, of um, negative uh, uh, outcomes like too much radiation, a false positive test. So I was just reading a figure today in a new article in the journal Health Affairs um, about mammography, which is of course a big issue in our country now. So if you read the papers, you know the, the dueling we have not the dueling <coughs> recommendations, you know, from the Preventive Medicine Society and the oncology. Right? I mean, it's huge, huge public discussion out there, uh, and uh, and the. Uh, and it's just hard for individuals to know what to do. But we are much more aware of, of tests that have what are called false positives and that it shows a sign of disease that's not there. The PSA, going back to men, the PSA test has far more, in unsymptomatic men, far more false positives than real positives. And then you, you, often you go down a rabbit hole. You go down a rabbit hole of, of tests. So it doesn't mean we shouldn't have these, but it means it needs we need to pause, take a breath, ask a question, uh, and be informed consumers. And, and part of it is then when we go home, this is why we want a cultural conversation, because when we go home, how do we talk with our family about this? Because if, if more is better, then the physician who does the extra test, who, does, who doubles down on the medicine, is going gonna, is gonna to look better. Unless, as in families and communities, we are dealing with the risks as well as the benefits. Our third, are there simpler, safer options? Uh, blood pressure, right? Uh, the, uh, the, the, the medicine that has been used for 50 years with a good uh, safety track record may be simpler and safer than something that is new and has some marginal benefit because the new medications, the research in new medications, they just have to show that, they, that they're effective in treating the original disease. They don't have to show that they're that much better than the existing ones, the ones that have been off patent, the ones that have been used for all those years. Uh, fourth, what happens if I don't do anything? That's the watchful way. What happens? And this is, I've worked a lot with primary care physicians, and this is sort of an undervalued uh, wisdom in some primary care is that if we have an ongoing relationship, if you're my primary care physician, and, and then you trust, I'll call you if it doesn't go away, right? Uh, whereas if we don't have a relationship, you may never see me again. I'm referred to you, uh, but if you, let's, let's, well, let's watch, Bill. Give me a call if this occurs or this occurs, and then you don't necessarily uh, jump. So what happens if I don't do anything? And how much does it cost? Now this one we know is a hard one uh, because um, we often don't know. 
but are there less expensive tests, treatments, and procedures that your insurance company may cover? Um, and what about generic drugs? So, do I really need this? What are the risks? Are there simpler, safer options? What happens if I don't do anything? And how much does it cost? So, the choosing wisely campaign is really suggesting that in medical clinics, these be posted somewhere because a lot of patients are afraid if they ask their physician this, they're going to seem disrespectful. Okay. Uh, and we, we need to create a cultural idea that it's okay to ask these questions. My universal experience, except for that urologist who I walk out on, uh, has been that most physicians, most physicians are happy to engage in this conversation. In fact, they engage in it with each other all the time, and most physicians are willing to do that. Now, you can't take 45 minutes to do it, I understand that. But most physicians nowadays are willing to collaborate. And my view is if you have somebody who's not willing to engage you in that, then you should probably see another doctor. Okay. Uh, so what are your reactions to these questions about the possibility of, of asking this kind of question? So this is sort of a, what, what, would somebody like to comment about, could you imagine yourself asking these questions? You're not in, could you? Yeah? yeah. Say, say why. Oh. Yeah. Um, it's good. Okay. Um, I have a condition and, and it's been a long haul with it and I think I've gotten to the point <clears> of <throat> I need to partner with my doctor mm -hmm. and part of that is I don't like to overspend on my insurance mm -hmm. either because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm aware, I'm a supervisor so I'm kind of aware of costs yeah. and that for our agency mm -hmm. but also I don't want to pay my deductible either if I don't have to, and, and I see that more as um, critical time yeah. or um, other situations than something I can manage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine yourself asking. I you have asked. asked. You <laughs> have asked. Good for you. Good for you. Now somebody else, could you imagine yourself or being challenged to ask these questions? I'm thinking of people who, you know, in the role of a patient here, not, not, not a provider. Somebody else like to respond. Yeah. Our journalist. <laughs> Youngest person in the room, it looks like here. <clears throat> um, I would like to say that I, I have asked these questions and I've and I've um, engaged in these kind of questions with a uh, doctor here recently. Um I I was I, I was uh, struggling with anxiety for years and um I had resisted um taking pills about it because um it had had um undesirable side effects before. Mm -hmm. And um this, this doctor was the first one that I really met that was able to sit down with me and explain things very clearly. And um, this, I, I feel like it's a very good point to go with the first question, do I really need this procedure? Do I really need this pill? Do I really need this thing? And he was willing to talk to me about that. And, he, and um, I feel like the most important thing he said was that um, this isn't a cure-all. This is something to supplement, to help. Yeah, so that's so no miracles here. Yeah, uh, but this th uh, this could assist you in the self help you're already doing. Yeah, great, great. Uh, one other person like to respond to because they want to really distribute this and try to get this out there. And part of what the uh, consumer reports folks, choosing lots of people are interested in, is could people imagine asking those questions as opposed to are they just nice ideas that nobody would do? So could somebody else respond? Yeah. I am my parents' medical advocate, and, the, and on my own, I've had five major surgeries. Um, this is a huge gift because a lot of people, when you're told you've got 15 minutes max yeah. with this person, yeah. go, and that physician comes in, you respect how busy they are and overwork, um, but to know what to say, and even if you come in with your little list, mm -hmm. some of the questions they'll answer in their explanation, and you're lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is an incredible gift, mm -hmm. because I'm brought along with a number of relatives in, in newer, I mean, for newborn things with my stepdaughter and so forth, because she doesn't know what to ask. Yeah. And maybe I'll have better ideas. So yeah. this is it's Great. wonderful. Great. I'll pass that on to the folks mm -hmm. that Okay. So the, the, the final thing we want to deal with, and Bill Adams, could you come back up here? Uh, is uh, what we can do together. Uh, and this is where um, our little group, um, the little group who can, uh, in the Twin Cities called Baby Boomers for Balanced Healthcare, 
Uh, we are unencumbered by uh, revenue in a budget. Um, we are a small group of citizens who have been meeting together for how many? 30 months. 30 months. And, and Bill uh, drives down to the Twin Cities every other Tuesday night for our meetings. Um, uh, so we've been tackling this at the level of the cultural idea that more is better. And Bill's going to, uh, uh, if you go to the last the handout, Bill's going to read it with passion. I have as much as a Minnesotan. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a native Minnesotan. <laughs> so Baby Boomers for Balanced Healthcare is a group of citizen baby boomers who believe that healthcare spending is out of control and will bankrupt our country unless we all take responsibility for changing how we do healthcare. Our focus is changing the cultural belief that more healthcare is better healthcare. In today's healthcare system, there are too many tests, procedures, and services that don't help and can harm. We are overdosing on healthcare. In addition to harming individuals, medical overuse deprives our country of resources for other priorities like education, transportation, research, community safety, and human services. We are calling for a new mindset that values balanced healthcare. Goldilocks healthcare, not too much, not too little, but just right. And why citizen groups are necessary. Provider groups and healthcare organizations are easily dismissed as wanting to reduce uh, uh, necessary care in order to increase profits. Public officials are accused of rationing, and we all remember about death panels when we had that discussion. And without new cultural norms, reform efforts will lead to backlash. Why a baby boomers group? We are a generation who came of age and abundance, witnessed medical miracles like the polio vaccine and heart transplants, and came to believe that more is always better in many areas of life, including healthcare. We were wrong. Now that we are elders, we want to lead a cultural conversation about restoring balance in healthcare. Smarter healthcare, not more healthcare. Thank you. So that's what our little group is about. <clears throat> and what we've done is uh, uh, we think that the conversation has to occur in local communities like we're doing here. <clears throat> and we've designed two formats for that. One is a small group conversational format for 8 to 12 people. Uh, and then the other is a larger format that we've done here tonight that, you know, from 15 to whatever. Um, so that as communities, we can address this <coughs> question of what are our cultural norms about more is better and how can we change them? And um, I'm glad to say we found out just recently that Consumer Reports is um, going to take our process, <coughs> our small group process and our larger group process, and uh, distribute those uh, uh, around the country, including to employers groups and others, uh, so that more people can engage in the kind of conversation that we're having tonight. Um, so the reason we're uh, videotaping this tonight, and thank you for being willing to, to put up with that, is to be able to show other groups how to, you know, how people can come together <clears throat> and, and respond to questions, uh, share, share stories, share perspective, uh, and be influenced. Um, uh, and because what we believe is that culture only changes through conversation <clears throat> and through a process of what's called social contagion. I don't know if you've ever heard that expression. But social contagion is how norms, ideas spread through a culture, kind of like a virus spreads. Uh, and that somehow, in the 20th century somewhere, we got to the idea that medicine could save us, that all, all problems could be diagnosed, that all treatments could be definitive, and that more is better, newer is better, more expensive. And this didn't, you know, if you go back a century or century and a half, that wasn't that wasn't the cultural norm as far as we know, but it has come upon us, particularly after the Second World War. And so um, when, when people begin to brag about their physician who does watchful waiting, uh, when people brag about grandma for making the decision to not do feudal end-of-life care, uh, when people uh, uh, ask the questions uh, to the physician in a respectful way, uh, when we question when people are on boards, I know people are on boards here, do we need an MRI in every, every hospital? Uh, do, do, you know, do, do we need all of that? Um, uh, that's when the cultural change comes about. So you're coming up here? Okay, okay, great. 
So we're, yeah, we're moving towards our, I was just in my great climactic. I mean, they were practically in tears. <laughs> Not true, but we can, people on the camera can thank you. Anyway, um, so, so what, we're, what we're about here tonight is the conversation, okay? And we encourage you to check out our website. Uh, we, we now have, see, we're a group of baby boomers, but the, the idea is for everybody. But we now have an undergraduate student who knows social media. So we're going to be on Twitter for a while. And we're going to be tweeting the world way out there. And, and Instagram and all that, I mean, we're going to be really in. You're going to be really pleased. You even heard of us before a while. Um, uh, and that's because that's how you get this conversation through the younger generation. So what I'd like to do uh, as a, as a wrap-up here, and, and you can be uh, filling those evaluations out, I'd like to have a few of you, since this is very participatory, I'd like to have uh, a few of you uh, say um, what you're taking with you from our conversation tonight. So we've been at this for an hour and a half or so, uh, and uh, so I invite you to reflect upon what you're taking with you, uh, and if you want to say what you're you know, what you're taking with you that's going to be useful to you and, and to the community. I'd like to end with a few people uh, sharing that. So with somebody, it's hard to do this maybe when you're writing, but that's okay. Um, would somebody like to say, so if you could, let me run this all the way back. Could you run this back there for me? Thank you. I got here late, so I'm, I'm not sure. This is actually a, a, a pessimistic <laughs> question, I guess. So, okay, so we're not doing questions. Okay. No, so we're, we're, we're just checking out. Okay. Okay, so, right. yeah, so, yeah, this is, we only have three minutes left, so we can't, we can't do any okay, questions. Well, I'll ask it first for you, baby. I, I, I'll be happy to, I'm happy to hang around and answer any question or any conversation, but right now, we're in what's called in any of the in groups, we're in the checkout phase. Okay. So if somebody would like to say what you're taking with you from our conversation. Yes. I will take this to my own peer group and expand the conversation with them. Okay. Thank you. Who else would like to say what you're taking with you from our time for today? Yep. I think I'm going to take the term watchful waiting mm -hmm. uh, to myself. To you, take it home to yourself. To okay. my peers and my family. Yeah. To my providers and to my community at large. I really like that. I think we are um, wanting, we're wanting instant gratification in everything. Mm -hmm. And our kids, we've unfortunately taught that to them. So I think we need to rethink that whole idea. And watchful waiting uh, works for a lot of areas in our life, especially helpful healthcare. Yeah. You know, it makes me think of one of the ways that my mother got away from too much resistance when we would ask for things. Instead of saying no, she'll say, she would say, we'll see. <laughs> Which is like, watchful waiting, we'll see. Okay, thank you. Somebody else, yes. Hearing the examples, like the dentist and the other ones, yeah. um, I guess it gives me a hope that things are already starting to change yeah. and that um, doctors are already giving choices as opposed to just saying, you need this, you need that. Yeah. And people are, are questioning and feeling okay about that. Okay. Great. You're taking hope. Now somebody else, what you're taking <laughs> with you tonight? Hard to write and uh, reflect at the same time. We're going to have to wait four more minutes, so we're just going to stand here. And you cannot eat until 7 o'clock. There we go. So I knew I'd flush something. Out. But it was the food, wasn't it? Right. Um, I'm a public health nurse, and I'm out in the community in Ottertail County, all yeah. over the place. And I'm just going to empower my people to question what the doctors suggest to them and um, empower them that they're the, they're the client and the doctor's actually working for them. Yeah. Yeah. And to do it in a respectful way, I think, you know, that we're, we're, you know, we're, we're on the same team. Uh, and so um, the change has to occur both, both sides. Thank you. Anybody else before we, we finish up? Okay, so um, very appreciative. Bill, would you come back up here? Uh, so um, Bill has been uh, very instrumental in getting the conversation about baby boomers for balanced health care out there uh, around the state. 
Uh, we're doing a webinar for the Choosing Wisely campaign about citizen engagement. This is all about citizens, all about us taking responsibility and not just assuming that everybody else has to change. We've been talking to healthcare leaders, uh, state officials and others, and one of the things that Bill read is a note I'd like to end on, that it's too easy to say that some, somebody else is responsible to make the change. Uh, and, but part of what happens is, if we the people don't shift our attitudes and step up uh, in, in terms of responsibility for our own health care uh, and, uh, and to resist overuse, then provider groups, health care organizations, if they, so we, we visited with the head of a big HMO, and what that person said was, if that HMO gets too far out ahead of everybody else to say, we need to have more balanced care, we don't want to overuse, they could easily get picked off by another group that says, we go all out for our patients, right? Can you just see that headline? Okay. And so uh, there has to be a fertile ground in the community for people wanting balance, saying what we call Goldilocks care. Not too much, not too little, but just right. So appreciate everybody coming today.